Welcome, Randolph Memorial Baptist Church. Welcome to uh, another snowy day, but this is the favorite kind of snow I like. It comes, but that's about it. We are only going to make one adjustment. Uh, talk to JR, our chair of deacons, and we are going to make one adjustment for the day. Uh, our team meetings, we're going to hold off to February 27th because the purpose of those meetings is to recruit and get more people involved. And this is just messy enough that some folks are online and some folks are just waiting. Uh, and I don't blame you. And I, I know we also have some folks who just do not drive when there's anything coming down. And I'm glad we're online for that because it keeps people safe. So in two weeks, we're going to meet. But that also gives me an opportunity to remind you what this is about. And the reason we're putting it off is because how important it is. So here, here we go. This church has several teams. We have an outreach team that plans events for outreach. We have a team for the hospital ministry bereavement when we lose loved ones. We have a uh, homebound for folks who can't get out. We also have a kingdom impact team that does small jobs. I say small job projects, really big jobs, ramps and, you know, things to help people in uh, more concrete ways that uh, around the house and things like that. All these teams are important and every deacon is on a team, but all church members are welcome to work alongside the deacons. In fact, these teams could not function without church members. And so, um, in two weeks, uh, we will we'll try this again, and at noon, when church is over, for 15 minutes, there's rooms assigned that you can go to just to learn more, and if you say, I'm glad I learned, but I really don't think I can do this, that we're not going to, no, no, no twisting arms, um, but it is definitely worth going to check out a team or two and seeing what might be a skill that you have, a skill interest or a passion interest, something you can do. And we certainly can. So de the deacons will do that for 15 minutes with you, and then we'll have a catch-up meeting after. But we're going to put that off for two weeks so that we uh, don't lose anybody who may be at home right now watching saying, I really wanted to be a part of this, but I was scared to get out today. We don't want to lose anybody for that. So we'll do it again in two weeks, barring, knock on wood, Virginia weather. Only in Virginia can you enjoy all four seasons in a week, right? Okay, there were shorts and t-shirts out yesterday, and today we were talking about, will we have church with snow? Uh, only in Virginia. So I can't promise what the weather will be, but hey. There are a lot of other things going on. Um, today, uh, excuse me, this week we'll have youth, preschool, and children on Tuesday. Hope you will participate in that. That's going really well. Wednesday's band. Tuesday afternoon is choir. Oh, she has some announcements, and I know some other people do too. I know the women's Bible study starts this Thursday. It's not going to be weekly, so pay attention to the calendar. It's a book study, but they're going to have a session this Thursday at 6.30. A couple of quick things I wanted to mention. Um, February the 24th, which is a couple of weeks from now, on a Thursday night in two weeks, uh, in the chapel, we'll be having a meeting at 6.30 for youth, uh, children, but youth and children, students, and their parents, and interested adults who want to help us during the interim time. Cadence's last Sunday, uh, last day at Randolph Memorial will be the end of March. And so what we want to do, there will be a lot of sign-up lists. And we want to uh, fill the gap, do the interim work, and pledge to our children and promise our children that uh, while we grieve when a minister leaves, we don't stop doing ministry. We'll continue. And we can do things different, just it, whatever we need to do. It's been a while since we've talked, and we're coming out of uh, a different uh, part of life, and so we can adjust uh, now that, you know, it's going to be warmer, and hopefully the numbers are down with COVID, and so it could be a time that we could really see some things that we needed, need to do again. So I'm asking anybody, adult, who wants to know more and be involved in the lives of our students, um, no one's going to force you to sign up, but I do want you to come to learn more, and parents especially, and this will be one of many meetings as we work hard to provide as a team, because the church is a team for those who we love. So please just come, and that will be What's sorry? It is February the 24th at 6.30. It's a very important meeting, and I'll be posting about it over the next two weeks. So I'm very excited that we can get this going. There will be some things we do to say goodbye to Cadence. Pay attention to Facebook, church page, 
and all of that. And as we get into March, you'll hear more about that. First Sunday in March will be our deacon ordination and our soup lunch. And uh, you want to, all that will be announced. So anyway, good stuff going on. Um, I know there's some announcements. Beth has one and Susie has one. Next Sunday um, is the 20th, February 20th. We are going to um, have a special recognition for women on mission in the church. And it's, as part of that uh, celebration, we're inviting all the ladies in the church to sing in the choir that day, just like we do for the men. And, uh, and we did earlier this year. We're going to do the same thing for the ladies. And um, so we're going to have a practice, one only, one practice at 930 next Sunday morning. We're singing a hymn called Here I My Lord. And um, I invite you, if you're, um, you may not think you, you're a good singer, but I bet you can make a joyful noise. So if you are able to come at 930 next Sunday morning, we will make that part of our larger service and recognition of women on mission. Good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about what I feel is the best outreach kingdom building ministry that we have at this church. And that is the cheer baskets. It's been a long time since I've been able to make announcements and actually be involved in it, thanks to that nasty C word, um, because we have not been in person for a full year, and then we did come back in person, and we had family things that were going on, so I've been away from cheer baskets for a while, but I'm back now, so you will see me. I will bug you. I will ask you to donate. Um, and I will let you know what we're going to be collecting. Um, there may be some changes along the way as things progress. And we may find that, that in time that there are things we need that we didn't know we needed. And I will let you know about those. Um, for February, we're going to start out our collection with canned foods. Um, think outside the box with those. While we will accept any canned foods, Peas, corn, and green beans are very popular. Try to think outside of that and get some other types of canned foods. Um, also check your dates. This is 2022, so we want the canned foods to be expiration dates of mid to late 2023. Um, there's going to be the collection, typical collection boxes in the connector building. And I am going to get with Amanda this week and see if she will do a monthly list. I had a couple people ask me. They would just like to know what we're going to be collecting every month, and we'll put those out at the collection box and at our little welcome thing out here in the foyer and whatnot. But uh, again, for February, we're going to be doing canned foods, and hopefully this year we can make this get back to normal, whatever normal is these days, and make this uh, the big ministry that it used to be for this church. Thank you. All right, we're going to begin with worship. The children's church, will, kids will leave at, as soon as Ancient Words begins. And so there will be a call to worship, prayer, and as soon as you hear the first notes of Ancient Words, you'll go out that way if you're looking forward to, to heading that way. Um, but I'm excited to be here. We're going to worship. It doesn't matter what that stuff in the area is coming down. Aren't you glad to be here where it's warm? The heat is working. You're here, and uh, God is with us. So let's praise God this day.
Good morning. Uh, please follow along with me as I lead us in our call to worship. God reveals beauty to us. God reveals truth to us. God reveals love to us. God reveals open hearts and open arms, always open to a message from God. Would you join me as we sing our hymn of um, praise and, uh, and the offertory hymn? It's number 31, Ancient Words. Let us pray. Gracious God, may those words draw us to service, to giving, to living, not just through the gifts we place, but the lives we live. Thank you for this day, and thank you for this church that you have called in this time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen.
seated. As we come to our prayer time, you may be seated. Lots of things to pray about, lots of folks to pray about. I want to give you that opportunity, uh, give you an update on folks. And um, I know that Gladys Mason's going to be at Heartland. Is at Heartland? I'm looking for confirmation, but I think that, I'm sorry? Yes, it's a new name, but it's the old Heartland. Yes, the old Heartland uh, near the hospital. And uh, we'll update that on our list. Also, uh, eventually this week, Stephen Pugh will be at uh, Bentley Commons. He's in uh, process there, getting there. And uh, we have our ongoing concerns, and we want to keep those in our prayers. Um, we want to continue to pray for, um, uh, well, begin praying. Uh, we, we had our first meeting this week. Start now praying about Vacation Bible School. Uh, summer will be here. It will. And we have a lot of work to do to get there. And so we had a great group of folks planning and dreaming. If you're interested in helping, catch uh, Katie Hamby, our uh, director, and I'm pretty partial to. So she's back there, and you can uh, contact her, and she will certainly take volunteers. So it is just getting started, and, and we are thrilled with those who have already starting to get involved, and we've got plenty of jobs to fill. So that is just underway. But I think it's important to start early so we can start praying and dreaming and being intentional and getting it done right. Begin praying for not only Cadence and Adam and their kids as they are in transition in, in this new adventure and chapter of their lives, uh, and pray for um, the church as we begin this interim time in, in about a month. Um, and, and so we know that God will guide each of us and that God's got this and we can do it, but we do want to seek God's wisdom and guidance as we go because we are a church and we want to be obedient. So be praying about how you might be able to be involved. Uh, you don't have to be a parent to be a part of changing kids' lives. Um, and so just be praying about that. Continue to pray for our hospitals, our medical personnel, our school systems, and all the things that are going on these days, uh, and uh, just being the light the world needs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we lift up in prayer this day these needs. God, we also give thanks for the following. God, we gather on this day where the weather may be a little bit less than pleasing. Uh, it may be kind of a messy time. The world can be messy. Life can be messy. There's often things that are a mix of good and bad and things we wish were different, but this is the world we, you have placed us and you know what you're doing and you're guiding us and you love us and your plan and your promise is sure. Help us to be faithful, to be obedient, to encourage those who need it, to lift up those who need that, but also to admit we can't do it all and we need you. To seek encouragement from one another and strength, to be a family, a church, seeking to be the people of God you've called us to be at this very present time. You have planted us here in this moment in history for a reason, and we are a part of that. May we be obedient, and may we, like Abraham and those we study, say, Here I am, O Lord, here I am. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say,
blessed to have such wonderful music in our church. Last week was fantastic, and today is equally so. And listening to the instrumentalists each Sunday, we are just so blessed to have on our left and our right some great musicians, and then behind me, just very, very thankful. Susie, appreciate you. All right, uh, today I'm not oblivious to the fact that there's something going on tonight that people will be watching on TV, but I don't think God is going to be rooting for either team, really, I'm sorry, uh, but I think you can root for either team, but I'm not wearing a jersey for either, but I do hope you have some fun. Uh, also know that this is also a bigger weekend because you're supposed to tell the people you love, you love them, right? So I hope that you'll do that. That'll get you in more trouble than who you root for. Uh, but uh, it is a busy weekend. I, my sermon next Sunday will be more of a love story, and it originally would have been today, but the snow threw off my schedule. So this is not a love story today, but we're going to have a love story next week. Uh, so our scripture today is Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. And it is a disturbing story, don't, don't get me wrong, uh, but we're going to see what it says to us today. So let's, let's look at this together. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on that boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make you de your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, take this story which can be very uneasy. And help us to figure out what it says to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Houston, we have a problem. We all know that statement. It's a line from real life, but what movie? Apollo 13. Great movie. The truth is, the line is a little bit off. It's not exactly what was said. The real quotation comes from the radio communications between the Apollo 13 astronauts, Jack Swigard, Jim Lovell, and the NASA Mission Control Center, which they call Houston, during the Apollo 13 space flight in 1970, two years before I was born. Some of you remember that day on the, on the TV. As the astronauts communicated their discovery of the explosion that crippled their spacecraft to mission control. But the words that were actually said by Swigert was this, okay, Houston, We've had a problem here. After being prompted to repeat it, Lovell said, Ah, Houston, we've had a problem. Still, Houston, we've got a problem, is a great line. It's famous, it's memorable, it is a great catchphrase when things go really wrong. 
and we may have all said it at one time or the other, or at least a variation of it. It's a big, uh-oh, which isn't something you want to hear if you're an astronaut, by the way. Oh, no. I bet you've said it, and if you haven't, I bet you've experienced it. Today's story with Abraham is a big, big problem one. God promised. God gave. They've got the blessed son. We spent sermons and sermons to get to this point. The future is bright. The road is ahead. It's all weighing upon this, this kid, Isaac. But then God speaks again. God calls, and sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the region of Morah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Now that text is, that's, that's difficult. As a kid sitting in Sunday school, it made me squirm. Sunday school teachers seemed to not be bothered by that in the 1980s. They would just put up on the flannel board, dad with a knife, taking son up to kill him. And I would sit there and say, what? Horrific. Cartoons, no big deal. I don't know if the VeggieTales have a version of this, but this is tough. This is a kid going to be killed by his dad. I never liked it as a kid. It really made me uncomfortable. So we got a problem. we got to be honest. And here's the truth. It's okay to ask questions as you read Scripture. God wants you to, to read this and think about it. It's okay to wrestle, and it's okay to say, wait a minute, what's this about? We have to do the hard work of biblical studies to figure out texts. Because if we believe in God, we should wrestle with anything that may make us go against the nature of God. Now, I'm not disrespecting the Bible, but please hear this. If, if our first reading would go against the very nature of God, then maybe we need to read it right, because maybe we're reading it wrong. God calls in this text and says for Abraham to take his only son, the one he loved, the one that was promised, the one we've been all trying to get to, and then sacrifice him. Now, in the ancient world, thankfully to us this sounds weird, but in the ancient world, sacrificing human beings wasn't strange. Bear with me. In many religious groups, human sacrifice has been a part of their stories time and time again from South America, Central America, over in other countries, especially in the ancient world. Children have died on altars throughout the world for various gods and goddesses. And it should upset us today. And so the new followers of this God, this one true God, might not have thought it was that different because that's what their neighbors were doing. So why wouldn't this God be like the gods of the other countries? But for us, it's a problem because we've come down the path a little bit, and it does seem brutal. Horrific. But it's that way because we now know more about God, and we also have Jesus. Now, the story we read today is named by Christians as the sacrifice of Isaac, but since he isn't really sacrificed, the Jewish people have it better. They call it the Akita, which means the binding of Isaac. It leaves us with a lot of questions. God has said that this kid was the future, so why would God take the future and wipe it away? So we as Christians will squirm because we do not see God as bloodthirsty and we don't think God plays games and we cannot imagine in any way Jesus Christ on earth telling any of his followers to do this. So we're puzzled. Is God in the Old Testament mean and the God in the New Testament good? Like a good cop, bad cop routine from law and order. Was God mean and then got some counseling and got nicer? No. No, no, that's not fair to Judaism, it's not fair to our Bibles, it's not fair to God. God's love is throughout the Bible, the Hebrew Bible as well. So what do we do? Well, let's walk through the story, figure out what's going on, and figure out what in the world it says to you and me on this snowy day. Abraham gets up early. He and Isaac head out with two young men, and they gather their supplies. Abraham has had his instructions. He's the only one, by the way, in this story who knows what this is all about. Nobody else knows. They travel and reach a point where the young men are told to stay. Only Abraham and Isaac are to continue. I want you in the horror of what is happening to hear what Abraham actually says. Don't just jump to the knife. Listen to what Abraham says to these two men. He says, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Did you catch that? We will come back to you. Is he lying to keep his son calm like some sadistic person? No, I think he really means it. He, do, he knows two will go up and two will go down. He's going to follow God, but he does not believe that he's going to lose his son. He is confident that both will return. He doesn't understand what's going on. Often with God we don't, 
but he knows God's not going to let him down. It's interesting. It is a sign that Abraham is going to be faithful, but he believes God is greater than this. And so they go up the mountain. He and his son carry the wood, and he carries that knife. The first century rabbis, who are not Christian and had no connection to Christianity, would write about this story. And we have a, a piece of writing where the rabbis are writing, not even thinking about Christianity. And they said this about the story. Isaac carries the wood for the sacrifice like one who carries his own cross. Because they had seen many Roman crucifixions. So I think that's interesting. So the son asks him, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And I can't imagine what Abraham was thinking and feeling, but notice what he says. Does he just say it to calm the kid down, or does he really believe it? He says, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So he believes in God, and they walk. They prepare the altar. This is something religious people did. I mean, religious people, including Jews, did this to animals, and bloodshed meant commitment and sacrifice. Aren't you glad we don't do that anymore? It would be hard enough to keep this place clean with that. Whew, that's tough. He ties his son up. Now, we don't know how old he is, but he's obviously not resisting. He allows his father to tie him up, a sign of commitment and love to his dad. And this is where it seems to be a horror movie rather than a Sunday school lesson, because there's a knife. But the angel speaks to him and says, Abraham, Abraham, and the old man who has followed God, and think about it, left his home, believed in the impossible, saw it come true, says, here I am. He was always going to obey God, and God says, don't do this. He is told that it was a test, that God knew everything, and everything was up to God, and there is a ram in the br brush. Also, as a kid, I always felt sorry for the ram. What did the ram ever do? But anyway, this is what they did in the ancient world. Better the ram than the boy. I get that. And just as Abraham said, two by two, make it down the mountain. Now, Abraham calls the place the Lord will provide, but the word provide means seen, so it's really the Lord will see. God has seen what has happened. Okay, let's figure this out. Holocaust survivor Eli Weisel, a faithful Jew, wrote about this story, and he said that if Abraham had killed his son, he would have destroyed God because that's not who God is, not at all. Our God is not and never has been in, entire, in our entire story ever demanded or followed through at least with human sacrifice. In fact, what's really interesting is when the Jews, finally, when Isaac finally has kids and they become a nation and they create this religious movement called Judaism, which Christianity will come from, in its very writings they will quickly add that they will not allow human sacrifice. It is at the heart of God to never take a human life to serve God. It's, it, they do away with because the Jewish people saw other religious people doing child sacrifice. And no, it will never be a part of religion in our faith. So if that's what's going to happen, why did God ask this? I mean, we sing about a God of love. How can this be true? First off, we have to be careful because the Bible never justifies religious violence. And if anybody ever tries to convince you of that, run. Uh, people may twist the Bible to make it violent, but that is not who we are. We are a people of love. So as I said in the beginning, the world Abraham knew, though, was one that mixed violence and religion. That's all he ever knew. And God, who he is encountering, is a new experience for him. And many people would have done what Abraham did because that's what religions did. Now, as I said, our world has moved away from that, to which I'm thankful. Uh, and yet there are still people, I have to say, who want to tie their religion to their violence. Christians and non-Christians who will tie some religion to doing something horrible. And that is not Christian. I think it begins... Honestly, when we begin to see somebody as an other, if we can dehumanize somebody, then we can excuse how we treat them. But as Christians, we don't do that. But back in the days of Abraham, let's not be mistaken, bloodshed was real. What Abraham was asked to do was not out of the historic norm, but, in, but what was weird to Abraham was that this was a promised son that was being threatened. So what do we think is going on? I think a couple of things. Let's move to today. I think this story exists from God to show us that this God is going to turn the page. That God is taking Abraham up on this mountain to show him what is often done, violence, and to say, this is not a God of violence, who will never demand us to kill in God's name. 
That's what I think. To show that the God Abraham is now being called to serve will be far different, and then the Jews will come along and spell that out, that our God will not demand violence and cruelty, not our God. And Jesus Christ would come to really make the point clear that we are to love our neighbor and even our enemy. Aren't you glad? But the story also exists to show faith. There was a true story of a pastor who was visiting the hospital, and he wrote about this. I read this in a magazine. And when he got there, back there used to be a day when you'd go to the hospital and they'd give you a clipboard and you could see who was in the hospital or, or even a computer screen, and it would tell you uh, their religious affiliation and you could go visit them. That's long gone. We have HIPAA. If you go to the hospital and don't tell me, I'll never know it. But I can remember early in my ministry going to the hospital and they would let you look through the roll and you'd go visit whoever you want to visit. Not that way anymore. But back in those days, you did. And he saw the man's name and he recognized the man, but then he looked under religious affiliation and the man wrote none, which normally means no religion, leave me alone. But the man had put a little asterisk by it. So that means there's a note at the bottom of the page. And at the bottom it said, in case of emergency, Methodist. I thought that was funny. You gotta hedge your bets. No religion, but if I'm dying, let me be Baptist. Um, in a sense, that's what we see. We really don't need God today. But if there's an emergency, a funeral, a wedding, or I'm bleeding on the side of the road, I need God. It needs to be better than that, right? Faith is not a parachute. Faith is realizing we need God when things are good or bad, and every day. Faith is following when we don't always get it or see the full picture. I wonder what is the greatest faith in this story. The knife being raised, which is scary, or believing that I may raise this knife, but I'm not going to need it. I think that's where Abraham showed his faith. He just believed that this God was going to do something, that both would be coming down. 110% he believed that. His faith was made in that statement that God would not fail him. And he believed he didn't get it all, but he knew he had God. He would, God would not take away the promise he'd waited 25 years for. Now, I, the struggle's real. Uh, he must have been falling apart. His heart was shattering. And when we hit rock bottom, God does build us back better. But he just believed God was doing something new. God wouldn't let it happen. Because our God is going to be different and better. So really both realities are happening here. God will show us something new, but God is asking for faith. And the truth is history never sits still. The march towards Jesus is coming. We as Christians can't help but see irony in this story. The Jesus who would lay down his life as the lamb and die for God's love for the world, and we who follow God through Jesus in faith. Not to die or kill for God, but to live for God, to love for God. Now, we have to accept that our world is in its own way is brutal, and much of what we see in our world does not reflect love. I'm not saying that Abraham's world was more primitive than ours. I look on the news and on the internet, and I see a really primitive world. We, we personally may not be guilty of the things that the people then were, but my friends, the darkness around us is very real. Our own rush to see people as other and hate them because they don't hold our opinion, it scares me where that could lead. I, I get heartbroken seeing the anger that people have towards the people they live with and shop next to because they don't agree on things. You can disagree, you can debate, but be careful. Never see anybody as less than you. Love your neighbor, even your enemy. Jeb Stuart Magruder might be a name you remember from Watergate. Remember that one? He stood before a federal judge at his conviction, and he said, I know what I've done, and your honor knows what I've done. Somewhere between my ambition and my ideals, I lost my ethical compass. When we lose our ethical compass, we find ourselves doing things we never dreamt we would. We are called by God to answer and to step each way and say the three greatest words that are in this text. Here I am. That is what God calls us to do. Yes, Christians often tie this story to the fact that God did not spare his son. No ram in the thicket for him. That God provided Christ to stop the violence and destruction in our world. To offer hope, and I guess my biggest thing about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus is that it is the greatest example of love the world has ever seen to turn the page again. And we believe that our God is not like the darkness we see and we experience. 
Author, teacher, mother, and cancer survivor, Kate Bowler, great, great writer, survived state, uh, latter stage cancer. She said, quote, I'm okay with ambiguity. For me, it's been liberating. Hope is something that rises out of the valley of dry bones, out of the ashes of despair. J. Alfred Smith had this wonderful quote from a sermon, she said. She wrote, hope is a tiny sprout growing in crooked concrete, in cracked concrete. Hope is a tiny sprout growing in cracked concrete. It's not what we necessarily expect, but it just might be this tiny sprout. So Houston, we have a problem. Tornadoes, pandemics, divorce, debt, disease, disappointment. But Houston, we have a promise. Did you get that? We have a problem, but we have a promise. And Abraham went up that hill knowing he had a promise. And we do too. God's love. God promises that there is love from God like no other love you'll ever have. That this love for the world is so great that God sent his son Jesus. One who no one replaced on the altar. Who gave himself on the cross out of love for all of us. That should change our lives in every way. And that, my friends, is really everything. Let's pray. Gracious God, none of us here are perfect. We are sinners saved by grace. But we do pray and we do seek you to be better than we are. We pray that if anyone has not known, does not know Christ as Savior, that we can come to know the one who loved us like no one ever has. But for, the, for those of us who profess Christ as Lord, it's hard to always live that, but you're calling us to it, to be obedient, to be faithful, to respond in love, and despite our differences and opinions, to always love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is God our Father, you have led us. As we stand, I'll be at the front if there is a decision you'd like to make public. Normally we gather outside and greet one another. I don't think that's happening today. Uh, as you head out to your cars, be safe as you leave. Um, I know this is the weekend of love, and so in that light, don't worry. Next week we got to get this Isaac married. So there's going to be a romance next sermon, and uh, he's a 40-year-old bachelor, and they got to get him married. So if you want to read ahead, read about that, but we're going to come and talk about that. But I do pray that we will keep to the promise. And that uh, when the problems come, we'll always keep the promise before us and God will be with us. I hope this is a good week for all of you. Be safe and uh, uh, love one another. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, as we leave this place, we thank you. What a wonderful church you've given us, a family that we love one another 
and we love our community. And as we head forward, let us put that to action. It's one thing to say I love you, but this week let us do something to show that love for someone in some way that is concrete and real. I pray that we'll do that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we pray, and all God's people say. Lead. Either way,